Okay. All right. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, last time, Cash asked me the question of whether we would have a crib sheet for the test. And I said yes, but that was sort of like before I realized I might just tell you the questions on the test, in which case you might do them in advance time. They're written on the which seems silly. So I'm going to kind of do what I did like last time and say there will be problems similar to these, but we're not going to do a crib sheet. Okay? So the problems that I am going to put something similar to on the test will be something like that sliding and spinning dumbbell example. And something like the number 24, which I did not assign to you, but I did give you the solutions in the key that I put up. All right, that's the energy. That's out of the energy chapters. That's chapter four, number 24. That was not a homework problem for you, but I did put the key in the solutions that are on Blackboard. Is that clear? Know everything else too, just for your own benefit, but those are the things that I'm going to use for my assessment. Things similar to those questions, certain things might be changed to protect the innocent. You know what I mean? Don't expect the exact same question, although I reserve the right to give the exact same question. <laughs> All right, uh, do we understand each other? Is there, are there any questions about that? All right, so it's two multi-part questions, just like last time. All right. Um, so without further ado, I guess, we can get right on to the good stuff. And Rodney, would you mind hitting the light? Thank you. Okay. So um, we were picking up last time when we were we had done we had solved the case where we had damped oscillation. So like two lectures ago, we solved all the different mathematical forms which you can of the oscillator. Last time we did the damped oscillator and solved it. And this time we are going to solve the driven damped oscillator. And I know I told you I'm going to skip stuff from this chapter. This chapter is so good. I can't find <laughs> stuff to skip. I mean, if I was going to skip something, it would be this. But this is so important. I just love it. So anyway, so I expect that next lecture will be on Fourier things um, uh, after the test. So we'll finish this chapter next week. And then we'll have the rest of the class on Lagrangian mechanics. Anyway, um, so let's go ahead then and uh, pick up from where we left off last time. So last time we said now we have the damped oscillator, but I'm going to allow there to be a, an external driving force that will be a function of time. And uh, in that case, I wrote Newton's second law for the non-trivial direction, which is the x direction, and plugged in that I have um, in the negative x as negative x components, I have the force from the spring, so that's, there's a negative kx there. The damping force, so there's a negative bv there. And then in the positive x, I've got f as a function of time. And that will be equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. So uh, putting all these other terms besides force on one side of the equal sign, I get this nice expression. Although I want to divide by mass, uh, similar to the way that I did for the damped oscillations, in which case I make this new definition of little f as a function of time, not to be confused with the drag force, so that's confusing a little bit, but just note when you see little f, that's gonna be the force per mass, divided by the mass of my object um, for the purposes of this derivation. And that is equal to x dot, uh, uh, d2 x dt squared, plus b over m, which we went ahead and defined as two times beta because that makes our mathematical solution for the damped case so nice, um, times uh, dv dt, uh, dx dt, and then plus k over m, which is clearly the natural frequency of the system squared times x. All right, so now that is our equation of motion, and our job today is to solve it. All right. Um, so what we're going to do, a couple of things that are just basically math side notes. One is it's a good time for us to define the linear differential operator. All 
all right? And um, really, we're only defining this because this is a very nice mathematical notation. So in this case, our linear differential operator is going to be the second derivative with respect to time squared plus 2 beta times the derivative of partial with respect to time plus omega naught squared. That's going to, for this case, be our linear differential operator. Now what makes this linear is that it satisfies a mathematical condition. So, um, just to be clear what I'm doing here. Okay. So, if I act with this operator on a linear combination of a, you know, of x1 and x2, where that's location of object 1 plus b times location of object 2, Okay, then what this operator will do is it will give me, well, A is just a constant, and it's going to commute with the operator, so it can come out front, and it will give me that operator acting on location of object 1, plus, similarly, B can come out front, give me the operator acting on location of object 2, all right? And so with that, we define it as linear. Okay, so... Um, are the reason, one of the nice things about using this notation is that the damped harmonic oscillator equation of motion becomes something very simple. It is just D acting on X is equal to F of T. Oh, in this case, I don't have it driven. This is just damped harmonic oscillation that I wrote there. So in that case of damped harmonic oscillation, I didn't have a driving force. It would just be d acting on x equals 0. And that makes it look like a function. So I'm going to write it one more time, d acting on x equals 0. So that's for the case where I just had damping. Um, and the reason to think about damping is that it's kind of a, it's got another sort of special term that I want to define. So just to remind you here that we aren't talking about the driven damped for this little aside. We're just talking about the damped for this moment because I want to define a mathematical term, which is the homogeneous equation. This is an example of a homogeneous equation. So what makes that equation homogeneous is that every term has x or some time derivative of x in it, all right? Um, and in it exactly once. So uh, every term has x or a derivative, derivative of x in it exactly once. All right. Um, because zero isn't included as a term. All right. So um, that's an example of a homogeneous equation. Now, if we get back to our uh, driven damped oscillator, uh, then we have an inhomogeneous equation. In that case, I have d acting on x is equal to some function of time that has nothing, that doesn't have an x in it at all and isn't zero, so it's actually a term. And so because such a term exists, this is no longer a homogeneous equation, and this is an inhomogeneous equation.
So our challenge now is that we need to solve an inhomogeneous equation, which we actually haven't done before. And the key to solving the inhomogeneous equation is something called the particular solution. And from that, we can get what the general solution. And I'll show you all of those steps. So uh, let's talk about particular. solutions. And then I want to talk about general solutions. And in order to get to the general solutions, they are going to include these homogeneous solutions. As you will see. OK. So uh, what we're going to do at this point is we're going to uh, follow the strategy where we are going to guess. It's riveting, I know. We're going to guess a particular solution. And uh, we're going to call that particular solution that we figure out x sub p for particular. And uh, obviously, as a solution, we're going to check it such that we know that our uh, linear operator acting on x of p is equal to that f as a function of time. OK. Now, then what we are going to do is we're going to say we also have the homogeneous solutions, which we do because we solved this situation in our last lecture. And let me remind you of that. So our last, in our last problem, this was the equation of motion. It was just damped harmonic oscillation. And we found a general solution to it, which is here. OK? All right. That's the critically damped, sorry. So the general solution doesn't have to be the critically damped solution. Let me see if I can find a better expression for the general solution. Mm. Sure. Let's use, we can also think of this as well. It's a more general solution. C1 times e to the something times time plus C2 times e to the something times time. So that's, a, that's, that's going to be what we consider to be our general solution. Because critically damping is not exactly general. It's too specific. OK. All right, so let's get back to where we were. So we have those solutions already. Um, and let me go ahead and write out what they are. Uh, so from last time, we have um, the homogeneous solution is going to be some constant times e to the r1 times time plus a different constant times e to the r2 times time. Where r1 and r2, uh, both of these functions here will die as t goes to infinity. We found that for the damped solution. That's always the case. So that implies that r1 and r2 will have a negative real part. All right? OK. Um, I guess it doesn't kill me to write that out because it's kind of important. Um, let's say where goes to zero as t goes to infinity. Okay. All right. So um, those are our homogeneous solutions from last time. So let's go ahead now and uh, note that what's 
we basically already have all the ingredients for the general solution. We have more than you think. Because if XP, if that particular solution, if we could guess one, um, is a solution, then XP plus XH will also be a solution. All right, the reason for that is that if I act with my linear operator on these two motions, right, then that is going to, because this is a linear operator, it'll be D acting on X, our particular solution, plus D acting on our homogeneous, homogeneous solution, where here is our homogeneous equation, so D times X sub H, I'm gonna go ahead and put an H up there for fun, is obviously zero, and D on X and P, let me go ahead and uh, got it here, D on X and P is already F, and that'll be equal to F. So what that means is that all we have to do is find one XP solution, and to get all other solutions, which will be our most general solution, all I have to do is consider that XP plus XH will be that solution. So that our general solution will be X of T will be XP if I can find one, plus some combination, uh, some constant times XH. This will be the general solution. So that's going to be our strategy. Uh, so let's go ahead and begin. So we want to find that, uh, we want to guess a particular solution. That is much easier if we can sort of simplify our equation. So um, in order to do that, um, let's start with a, a, a special case. So we need to sort of pick a function for our driving force. So, uh, and we'll solve the problem for that. So what we're going to do is we are going to get the solution for a sinusoidal force. Um, So we're going to have our driving force be sinusoidal. And you might say, why? Well, um, a couple of, well, a couple of reasons are this is the only type of force that can really have a long-term effect on the system. It's why if you want to push somebody on a swing for a long time, you push with the exact, with a certain frequency, and that force is well approximated as a periodic force, and, and you can do that as a, crudely with a sine function, but you can also do that with Fourier series. Um, and uh, which leads to something else. Another reason for that is, you know, we've already talked about how this is not just a mechanical thing where we have oscillations. We also have electrical oscillations. Um, and that driving force there, like for instance in your radio, would be a passing electromagnetic wave which provides a sinusoidal E field or B field, whichever one you want to use. Um, and the other reason for doing this for a sinusoidal force is that if you have a solution for a sinusoidal force, then you have a solution for any force because any force can be written as a series of sinusoidal forces through Fourier's theorem. So that's what we're going to do. All right. All right. So our sinusoidal force is going to um, take the following form. We're going to consider f of t sinusoidal such that f of t is equal to some constant times cosine of uh, omega t. All right. And choosing cosine and it, writing it in this way basically also chooses our time coordinate system, which is fine. Okay, um, so 
we should also remember that this f of t, because I don't want to get too far afield, is equal to that driving force divided by whatever mass is, is of our oscillating system. Okay. So um, another thing that I want to point out is that this omega here is the driving frequency. And omega naught was what we would call a natural frequency. That would be the frequency of our system if there were no force except for the restoring force acting. So I just want to be clear that this omega is not equal to omega naught necessarily. We'll also, it could be equal to omega naught, but it doesn't generally have to be. Okay. Okay. So um, it would be, I mean, in the case that omega is equal to omega naught, then you have something called resonance, which we'll talk about next time, where you'll have a maximum amount of energy given to your system, um, and, and that will be the maximum effect of the driving force, but that'll be for next time. All right. So let's go ahead then and write out our, our equation of motion for this particular force. on the previous page here. All right, so I've got x dot dot plus 2 beta x dot plus omega naught squared x is equal to f of t, which is f naught cos and omega t. Okay, so this is our equation of motion. I'm going to give it a little star to represent it because I might want to refer back to it at later times. Now, in order to do this uh, solution most easily, it makes sense to make our equation, which is currently a real equation, into a complex equation. So in order to do that, we're going to do the following trick, which is to note that for each solution of an equation like this, there will be another solution of a different equation, y double dot plus 2 beta y dot plus omega naught squared y is equal to f naught times sine omega t. So there's nothing wrong with that. We'll call that double star. And our trick will be to define a complex function, z, as a function of, which will be a function of time also, which will be equal to x plus i, y. All right? And uh, in order to consider this variable, what I'm going to also consider is that it's perfectly fine for me to take equation star and add it to equation star star, meaning adding up the left-hand sides, adding up the right-hand sides, except I'm going to multiply equation star star with i. When I do that and incorporate this definition, the result that I get, and I'm not going to show you the intermediate couple steps because they are quite easy, is that z dot dot plus 2 beta z dot plus omega naught squared z is equal to f naught times e to the i omega t. All right. And we'll call that equation triple star. And that's the one we're actually going to guess particular solutions for because it's just easier to deal with exponential functions and guessing. Um, Perfect. All right. So um, when we do solve this, though, we should remember from this definition that we can always get x out from our solution because it will be the real part of z. All right. So we're going to solve this for z just because it is an exponential function, and it'll be easier for us to guess our solution. So indeed, we're going to guess now 
And we are going to guess that our solution is that z is a function of time is equal to some constant times e to the i omega times time. Where this omega is the same thing as that driving omega. Okay. So um, let's plug in and see what we get. So we're going to plug that in right here, and I'm going to give you guys a moment to work on it, and I'm going to work on it. If you get to the point where you can, go ahead and solve it for C. I'm going to go ahead and start working. Wish me luck. So I've got the second derivative, so that's going to give me i omega quantity squared, so that's negative omega squared, c e to the i omega t, plus 2 beta times i omega c e to the i omega t, plus omega naught squared c e to the i omega t is equal to f naught e to the i omega t. So in terms of the time dependence, this is a solution because the time dependence just canceled out. So that was why we did what we did in terms of making our equation into something complex because it's easier to guess solutions that will do that. So the time dependence of this is indeed correct. So the only thing that I need to think about is this constant up front, which is indeed a complex number. So I'd like to solve for what that must be in order for this equality to hold. And so what I get is that C must be equal to F naught over, and I'm going to go ahead and put my omega naught squared out front, omega naught squared minus omega squared plus uh, I times 2 beta omega. That's my solution. So that tells me that indeed this guy here, my guess, is an actual solution where C must be equal to this object. All right, that is a really, a really and truly a solution. Now is it the general solution? No, this is a particular solution. It is something that I guessed and it worked. Now I want to talk a little bit about this constant. Um, this constant is a um, deceptively simple looking thing. If I pull my minus sign out front, this 
function here has, a, so this is not something I should be teaching you right now. All right. This, this is something that appears out of classical mechanics, but this guy right here is probably the most important thing in quantum mechanics. This thing is called the propagator. And you might be like, what? Why does this have anything to do with anything? Um, this is the thing that is represented for which you solve using Feynman diagrams. This is sort of the nut meat of quantum mechanics in terms of Feynman's um, representation. Kind of like we have, we're going to have Newtonian mechanics and then we'll have Lagrangian mechanics, which also contains all the same information through different math and different ideas. We have the same sort of thing in quantum mechanics where we have sort of, you know, Heisenberg quantum mechanics and Schrodinger quantum mechanics. And then we'll also have um, Dirac quantum mechanics and culminating in Feynman quantum mechanics. Uh, and the whole goal of Feynman quantum mechanics is to find propagators. And you might say, what does this have anything to do with particles? Well, in a propagator, it has to do with going forward in time from here to here. But because there's a particular relationship between time and energy, you can Fourier transform time dependences to energy dependences. And when you do that, so these omega's frequencies here are really those energies of the particle divided by uh, Planck's constant. That's what these frequencies represent in quantum mechanics. And, uh, and so anyway, so this is something that's very, very important in quantum mechanics. Again, this is part of why I couldn't skip anything in today's lecture because it's so important, not necessarily for this class, but for future classes that you realize, oh, this is something big. It has to do with oscillators when you talk about uh, uh, classical mechanics, but when you get to quantum mechanics where particles are oscillators, this is sort of it, all right? Anyway, so yeah, so put a pin in that. You won't see it again until graduate school because undergrad quantum mechanics, I don't think we'll do that. All right, so then let's move on. We can shake that off, okay? Just as an aside, you don't need to know that. All right, um, so let's go ahead then and pick up where we left off. So now we have a particular solution of our equation of motion. So in order to uh, get that we have this constant here and we've written it out here but it would be nicer if we could write that constant since it is complex in terms of its magnitude and angle in the um, imaginary plane so um, let me go ahead and write that out so as a complex number we can write it as you know, the real part plus I times the imaginary part, but we can also write it as some magnitude times an E to the I delta. And um, in this particular case, it is going to make a little bit more sense for our next, for our final solution to choose an E to the minus I delta, which is fine too. So we're going to try to express this complex number in terms of its amplitude and a phase angle in the imaginary plane. All right, so let's do that. All right, so in order to get A, all we have to do is notice that A squared will be equal to the complex number times its complex conjugate. That'll give us the, amp the magnitude of that vector squared. You guys, I'm not sure if you remember what I'm talking about, but so here's my imaginary plane got real, I've got imaginary, I've got this thing here, which has a real part plus an imaginary part. And uh, obviously, A is a hypotenuse here, so that's the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared, which is also C times its complex conjugate. So C times its complex conjugate. So here's A. And for our purposes here, we're gonna uh, define that this guy here is a negative delta, but we'll talk about that more later because that's, that's a fine thing to do. All right, so <laughs> in order to find amplitude, amplitude, we've got this guy. We know C, so we're going to go ahead and plug that in. I've got F naught over um, omega naught squared. 
minus omega squared. Plus, uh, how is your 2i beta omega, I think is how your author chooses to write that. Times its complex conjugates, we just have to take every i and turn it into a negative i. Okay, and so what I get here is a is equal to, so I've got f naught squared as my numerator. And then I can write, notice that down here I have a product of two polynomials that'll give me the difference of two squares. So it'll be omega naught squared minus omega squared quantity squared. And then um, minus but then I've got i times i, so that's going to give me a plus for beta squared omega squared. And quantity square root will give me the value of a. And f naught should have been squared. Okay. So in this case, given that my uh, real part of, um, let's go ahead and put a box around this because that is our expression for A. So with this expression for A, I'll remember that my real part of Z particular is X particular, a particular solution to my original equation of motion, single star. So what that means is that X particular will be equal to A which is in this box here, times the cosine of, well, let's see. Co so I'm going to have e to the i omega t times e to the negative i delta, or del. So that's going to give me i times the quantity omega t minus del, which the real part of that will be cosine of omega t minus del. So hopefully you see why we made del negative was so that we would have the same form for our um, uh, oscillatory motion as we had in our original solution. So, all right. So, um, something to notice about uh, this solution is that a will be its maximum value when its denominator. Denominator is the only thing that you can that you can vary here because f naught's a given. You know. Um, so when omega naught is equal to omega, then my denominator will become minimized because remember beta just has to do with the drag force of the medium. So uh, in that case, you see that A becomes its maximum value when omega, the driving force, is equal to omega naught, which was something that we were expecting. If you drive something at its natural frequency, then you're going to get it's maximum absorption of energy. Energy is of the system is what? One half Ka squared. So when A is max, the energy in the system is max. Okay. So finally, I think we're ready to write um, our, um, oh, we're not quite ready to write our general solution. I still have to find del. Okay, let's find del. Um, so I think what I should do here, yeah, I'm going to plug in this form of my solution into triple star. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to have from triple star. Um, I'm going to use that, and I'm going to use this form, and that's my solution. All right, so I've got z double. I feel like I've already done this, but I don't. I don't see. It. Oh, it's kind of right there. Okay, it can be also from right there. I'll just plug in first. Um, I could make this a, a quadruple star, but let's not. I'm going to plug in from right there. Okay, so I've got minus omega squared 
times C, which is A e to the minus I delta, plus 2 beta I omega um, times, again, A e to the minus I delta, because there's a C right there, plus omega naught squared times a e to the minus i delta is equal to f naught, which is purely real. OK. So in this case, I have, let me go ahead and do a little bit of math here, negative omega squared plus 2 beta i omega plus omega naught squared times e to the i a negative i delta is equal to something real. And it's f naught over a, both of those are real, it's a real number. So that tells me that whatever's on the left hand side of my equal sign must also be real, which tells me this object here can be written as um, some real number times e to the minus or times e to the positive i delta. Where delta will indeed be the delta that's right here in my expression. So that's what I'm going to solve for. OK. So um, let's go ahead and write that out. b e to the i delta is equal to minus, uh, let's change that to omega naught squared minus omega squared plus 2 beta i omega. All right. So what I'm looking at here is that I don't really care about these magnitudes, although they must be equal. What I care about is in my um, imaginary plane, where I've got imaginary axis and the real axis here, this object that's on the right-hand side here, it's got some magnitude like that. But it's got an imaginary part and a real part, and the ratio of them will be equal to the tangent of delta. So the tangent of delta must be equal to the imaginary part of this right-hand side over its real part. And yeah, in theory, it should be that divided by b, but they're both going to cancel in terms of the numerator and denominator anyway. Okay. So I've got its imaginary part, which is just the 2b omega, divided by its real part, which is omega naught squared minus omega squared. OK. So I have now solved for delta. It is the arctan of 2 beta omega over omega naught squared minus omega squared. OK. Now, I really and truly do have my particular solution. So xp is equal to, which is a function of time, is equal to a times cosine of the driving force times time minus del, where a and del are given in the boxes here. So that's my particular solution. And if I want to know my general solution, it will be my particular solution um, sure. plus my previous, my homogeneous solution. So C1 e to the R1t plus C2 e to the R2t where R1 and R2 both have negative real parts, meaning that these terms here are called transients because they die exponentially with time. They only depend, they're only necessary to meet our x initial, our initial boundary conditions for our initial location and initial velocity, but these will die exponentially as t goes to large. So they won't just die, they'll die exponentially. The point here is 
those are very transient. So in the steady state, after a little time goes by, your only solution will be this first term. And if you wanted to make a plot of the solution of motion, you might say, okay, well, here's this particular solution. My actual solution might be something like, so after some amount of time, my particular solution and my general solution, as long as a little bit of time has gone by, they are exactly the same. Which means that if you want to know what is the steady state, what is the solution of motion for this thing, after a few, you know, a little bit of time goes by in order for those initial conditions to sort of die out, uh, this is our solution. And this, our, our, this solution here, That's our long-lived solution, and it has nothing to do with initial conditions. It only has to do with the driving force, all right? So uh, in this case, I know I'm out of time, but I want to say in this case, this motion, because all things go to it after a little bit of time goes by, is called an attractor. And as we get into things like nonlinear motion and chaotic motion, you might have multiple attractors in which there's a problem. But in this case, there's only one unique solution that is the attractor. All right, so that is our solution uh, to, this, to this situation. So, all right, so we're going to start next time with resonance and then Fourier stuff. And I'm sorry I can't find anything to leave out of this chapter. It's just all pretty good stuff. So continue to read through. I'll continue in order. Oh, and next time is the test. Were there any questions about the test? I'm sorry. Monday's the test. Be prepped for those things I mentioned. All right, see so you guys. Like, is anybody going to see... Dakota or Ryan? Anybody gonna see him? All right. All right. See you later. Have a good weekend. Thank you. You too.